Well, hello students, Tim Mann here, your instructor on this series of classes on the subject, The Nature of God, The Nature of God. We're bringing you, uh, I believe this is a, le a lesson number 11 in this series, and uh, we want to get right into it today. Uh, we're, we're hoping that we're teaching you quality things about the nature of God, which will enhance your personal relationship with the Lord. Also, that these things that we're teaching you will help you in your processes of biblical interpretation. You know, you're interpreting the Bible. Whenever you teach, whenever you lead, you're presenting to the people that you teach and that you lead uh, principles that they're going to build their life upon. Now, what we all want is to be able to hear the voice of the Lord. We all want personal commentary. We want God to be able to speak to us, to our heart, to our mind, to be able to lead us and to direct us. Now, that comes through a process whereby the physical Word of God, the written Word of God, the Lagos of God, is so in our hearts. As it says over in Mark's Gospel, one of my favorite section on the parable of the sower, Mark chapter 4, there it says the sower soweth the word. Now that word word there is the logos of God. It is the Bible. It is the sum total of God. It is in Greek writings the divine expression. We call it the Bible. Now the Bible by itself uh, without the Holy Spirit's activity doesn't change anybody. It's just a book of literature. But there's something unique about the Bible, the word of God. God. And so it begins to get into the hearts of people, the ground, according to the parable. And as that gets into our ground, it begins to grow. It begins to increase. It begins to change from just a seed to a plant and ultimately bearing fruit. Now, the, the, the process is, is that we sow the logos into the hearts of people as ministers, as leaders, as preachers and teachers. But then the Spirit will begin to bring that out of them, out of their heart in time of need. And then it's not the logos anymore. Now it's called the rhema, the spoken word, that which the Spirit, according to W.E. Vines, Expository Dictionary, New Testament words, the, 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 the rhema is the sword of the Spirit. It is that which the Spirit brings to our remembrance a prerequisite being the regular storing of the mind, the heart, uh, with that logos of God. And so that's what we want to do. But now if you don't understand God, if you yourself, you could be quoting verses, and I know it's possible, but we want to get understanding in the hearts of people. And so if you don't know that, if you don't know the understanding, if your understanding of the Lord is inappropriate and, and it's going to corrupt then what you teach, which will affect negatively the ability of people to begin to bring forth the reign of God from their heart. And so that's what we want to do. So we teach these principles on the nature of God, endeavoring to help you with your understanding of the good things of God, who God is, how God functions. You'll get to the point where you'll be able to look at a circumstance, a situation, and you'll be able to interpret it and say, you know, uh, that wasn't God that did that. Oh, that must have been the devil because I know the nature of God. Therefore, just looking at this, I know God didn't have anything to do with that. And so that's what we want. Now we're using as a textbook for this series of classes, the book by Dr. Lester Summerall entitled The Most High, The Most High, Seeing the Almighty. And basically what he does is a good job theologically from our perspective, from our, uh, you know, from our theological uh, perspective. He does a good job in bringing out the basics. Now we could get other books that are much more uh, theological in nature, all right? Uh, there are quality books that I have on my shelves, some behind me and some in my other shelves here in my office and my uh, in my study. And we begin to see there's a lot of study that we can do. But this has been a good book, a good overview book. Now, uh, to finish this book is, is required for uh, the rest of your assignment. So you're going to find when we get to the point of your final exam, there will be a question on, our, did you read the entire book? And our hope is everybody says yes. This book does not take a long time to read. It's an easy read. It's filled more with outlines than just dialogue. In some of the later uh, chapters, he's got a lot of stories about different demonic influences and nations and so forth. So it's an interesting read. And so that's a good way for you to get a, a substantial portion of your grade in this class period, in this subject period. All right, open your Bibles with me, if you would please, to the book of Galatians the book of Galatians, and today we're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. We're not going to talk about it, though, from the concept of it only being within us, 
but from the concept that the fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. It is the nature of God that He wants to grow in us. So we're going to look at some of these, some of them we've already looked at, but we're going to look at some of the fruit of the Spirit today and see if we can grasp some more information about the nature of God. So we want to read out of the book of Galatians chapter 5 beginning at verse 22 through verse 25 and it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So, not only are these called the fruit of the Spirit, and we recognize in one context it's fruit that grows in our life. But So it's the fruit of our own spirit. But it's also the Holy Spirit flowing to us and through us, enabling us to do that. You know, it's kind of like a tree. A tree without the sap is a dead tree, all right? And so there's a life-giving force that floods up through the inside of the tree that then gives the sustenance and the life that is needed for it to grow leaves, and if it's a fruit tree, ultimately to grow fruit. So without that sap, then the tree's dead. I mean, it's still got the limbs. It's still has, you know, the structure of the tree, but it doesn't have the life-giving force. And so what, what is it that makes us grow the fruit then? It's that life-giving force of not just some uh, inanimate uh, sap, but, but God himself, God flowing through us. And it's part of the, the, the Trinity, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, that seems to express that that is his responsibility. And so notice that we call then in the word here in Galatians 5, these abilities fruit, meaning that they grow. But that doesn't mean they automatically happen in a believer's life. They must be cultivated. There's, there's, there's forces that compel them to grow. Now, what we want to do is we want to take a look at where the sap comes from. Okay, you're not going to get apples out of the sap of a peach tree. You're not going to get cherries out of the uh, sap of an apple tree. You need the right kind of sap. You're going to be, you're going to be growing fruit. You've got to have the right kind of tree, but not just the physical structure of the tree trunk and so forth, you got to have the right kind of life that is flooding up in that tree to be able to grow the fruit that is required, which means then that, that, that an apple tree just doesn't grow apples. An apple tree is in essence apples, okay? That tree is the result of an apple seed, and it's a simple product than growing apples because it's an apple tree. So the fruit of the Spirit then is a simple process for the Holy Spirit because it's the fruit of the Spirit. Now, no where y'all come from, but where I come from, the Holy Spirit is as much God as the Father is God, as the Son is God, all right? The Trinity, uh, he, there is the Father, there is the Son, there is the Holy Spirit, says in Genesis in chapter 1, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. We've already brought some of those things out. This isn't a class on the Trinity, but we talked about how that there are three of them, the triune uh, elements of God, the, the tri, the Trinity of God. And so the reason why these fruit grow is because it is the essence of the Spirit. He is the tree of the fruit. And so, the, so not only is this fruit that God desires for us to have in our life, but it's, it is the essence of who God himself is. Now look over in John's Gospel in chapter 5. John chapter 5. I want to read some things that kind of diagram this picture for us a little bit, that fruit grows as a result of the structure that is kept connected to and the life that is flowing through that structure. So John chapter 15, John chapter 15, the Gospel of St. John chapter 15, we're going to read verses 1 through 5, 1 through 5, John 15, 1 through 5, and just follow along with me in your Bible, if you would, please. Jesus is speaking. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in 
me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So Jesus is the vine. You and I are the branches. So the vine would be like the trunk of the tree. We don't grow on the trunk. We grow on the branches or we're out on the end of the limb on the branches and the fruit grows on us. But that fruit is a result of something that is flowing through us. And this fruit is called the life of God, the zoe, Z-O-E of God. You got two principal Greek words. You got a couple families of words and you got more than one, but the two principal families, one is zoe and the other is bio. Those are the Greek words that we find concerning life in the New Testament. And so bios life is where we get our English word biology and so forth. And it talks about basically natural life. And so all of us, our physical bodies, has some element of natural life. Every, uh, every animal on the face of the earth has some element of natural life. And then the other word is the word zoe. Z-O-E is how it is transliterated from the Greek language. And that basically means the life of God. Now, now we're not just talking about a a lifestyle, though it will include that because that's what flows through him, so he's going to live that way, all right? But we're talking about the sap, if you if you can say it that way, of the tree of God. Uh, what is it that makes him who he is? What is flowing through him that flows out from him through the, the branch in or through the vine into the branches, which is you and I, which causes them the fruit of the Spirit to grow on up. There's a sap there, a family sap, uh, a family blood line, so to speak. And it's and in the Bible, it has a name. It's called Zoe. It's translated life. Now, throughout the Bible, we find this life and we find many things about this life. And I just want to bring out some of them because this is, in essence, where this fruit comes from. This is the stuff of God, all right? Not stuff God does, but stuff God is that enables you and I to experience all this and have it in us, all right? Life, life in the Bible. Here's some different terms that we find in reference to this word life. We find the word just simply life. Then we find resurrection life, everlasting everlasting life. Everlasting means um, uh, literally uh, non-ending life, eternal life. It's more than just living forever in that. It's a state of living, all right? Bread of life, light of life, the word of life. The Bible's called the word of life, newness of life, resurrection life. I like that one. We said that in there at the beginning. That means we don't live like everybody else in the world lives because we've already experienced a spiritual resurrection. Uh, we find these terms used in phraseology in the New Testament. It's called the law of the spirit of life. See, if you're born again, if you're genuinely born again, then basically what that means is there's something flowing through you. It isn't flowing through everybody else in the world. So you're going to live different. You can't, you got to force yourself to not live different. Okay. Uh, the Bible says we reign through life because of this life. The Bible says in this life, we live and move and have our being, not in this temporal life. Life, but in this life nature that is in, inside of us. Death works in the world, the Bible says, but life works in us. Now here's some verses in this. In John chapter 1 verse 4, it says, In him was life, Zoe, and that life was the light of men. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Now see, it's the substance of God now that's flowing through you. It's called life. So just like that, that tree has life, it has sap, there's a life to the tree. You can still have the structure. You can still have the tree trunk. You can have all the limbs and everything. We can still have people. We can still see bodies. They can have bios life, but that doesn't mean that the zoe life of God is flowing through them. And that Zoe life isn't just something God has. It is the essence of who God is. All right. John chapter four, verse 14, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. And so now we, we realize we have a flow of a river on the inside or a well that bubbles up on the inside of us. Many believe this is indirect 
reference to the personage of the Holy Spirit. The essence of the life of the Spirit is bubbling up on the inside of us, bringing us to this everlasting life, this Zoe life, a different kind of life than bios life. No longer just animals, so to speak, but now we have a essence of life like God. John 5, 26 says, For as the Father hath life in himself, so he hath given to the Son to have life in himself. So whatever it is is flowing through the Father that makes him God, the same stuff is flowing through the Son and makes him God. It's a nature. It's an essence. It's a, it's a, it's a being. It's not just something they have. It, you can't separate this from them. You can't separate Zoe from God. All right. It's not something he has in a cup and he pours a little out whenever he wants to. It is the stuff that makes him God that now as children of God, born of the seed of God, now you got the same stuff flowing through the inside of you. John 6, 33, it is the spirit that quickeneth or makes alive the flesh profiteth nothing. The words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So the word of God then is this Zoe stuff, all right? It's part of the essence of who he is, what he does. Uh, John chapter 6, verse 68, John 6, 68, we just read 6, 63. Now this is 6, 68. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Second Corinthians 3, 6 says, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter that killeth, but the spirit that giveth life. And so we have then this life bearing or this life producing essence in us. It's because of who we now are, because of the Father, because of the Son and the Spirit and who they are. Now here's one that's kind of interesting. I threw this in as a little negative. All right, this is Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 10 and 11. I challenge you to do a little more study on this particular one. Jeremiah 12, verses 10 and 11 says, many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden down my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it desolate, and being desolate, it mourneth me. The whole land is made desolate because no man layeth it to his heart. Now, I want you to go through there. We're talking about vineyard. Remember the the vine and the branches. Now, whenever we start inserting men between us and God, we're going to get a different kind of life that may begin to flow through us. So go, go over and read that. It's a parable uh, in the Old Testament, stories in the Old Testament. There's a lot of vineyard stories in the Old Testament, and all that is of the same concept. The God plants a vineyard. Why? Because he wants this life to flow and produce fruit in us as it flows and produces fruit in him. All right, and so I hope you grasp that principle or this concept that the fruit that grows on us is the essence of who God is. What does that mean? Well, that means that we can study the fruit, not just from the concept of what what God wants us to do in life, but from the concept of who God is, the nature of God. It's his life-giving substance that now flows through us. It enables us to bear the same kind of fruit as who he is, which means that if we study these fruit of the Spirit, we will get a very clear perspective on the nature of God. These fruit are the nature of God. They're not just something we're supposed to do that he's independent from. Well, you guys, uh, you love, but I'm not going to. No, God is love. We already did a whole class on the love of God, that God is love. So let's get in then to back into Galatians chapter 5, start at verse 22, and let's examine the fruit of the Spirit in the order that they're listed. Now we're going to skip over the first one because the first one is love, the agape, the divine love, the strong love. It's the compassionate devotion. It's, it's, it's the love that really isn't feeling. It's an action. It's a desire. It's a decision. And so all of us as Christians, we should start with that kind of love in our life. But we've already taught a whole class on God is love as part of his nature. Now we're going to go on to the next one of these fruit of the Spirit, establishing already that these fruit are the nature of God. They're the result of the life of God that flows through us, that flows out of him, that makes him who he is, that ultimately then makes us who we are. So the fruit aren't something we're just trying to produce. Because we are the sons of God, then this stuff flows through us 
and if we just let it, then this fruit grows on us also. I hope you grasp that, all right? Let's deal with the second one in the list, and that's the word joy, joy. So the fruit of the Spirit is joy, but the nature of God is joy. Did you catch that? The fruit of the Spirit is joy, but the nature of God is joy. Now, most of you didn't, have not had a, um, a, a mindset concerning that God's nature was joy, all right? Most of you thought he was some sourpuss sitting on a big throne with a big stick waiting to squat you in some way, but that's not true. If the fruit of the Spirit is joy, then the nature of God is joy, all right? What do we mean when we say joy? Joy, the Greek word joy, is the word chara. It's the emotional excitement, gladness, and delight over blessings received or expected for self and others. That's a kind of a generic Sunday school definition. Let me give you some more in-depth uh, definitions. Now, this one is from um, uh, the Loanida Greek lexicon. It says this, all right, joy, a state of joy or gladness, of great happiness. In a number of languages, joy is expressed idiomatically. For example, my heart is dancing, uh, my heart shouts because I am happy. Do you realize God's personality is? He's joyful. His heart is always dancing. His heart is always shouting. He's not mean-spirited. He's not sitting there angry all the time. Listen, we've made God uh, angry. We've made God mean. We've made God some judge sitting on his, his, uh, his, his desk with his gavel and, and ruling against us in a mean attitude and a mean spirit. No, God's happy. God's dancing. God's joyful. That's a different picture, isn't it? Let me tell you, if there's a happy party going on, the Holy Ghost will be right in the middle of it, man. He loves joy. It's part of who God is, not just things that they do. Vine's uh, Dictionary says, joy is delight. It is gladness. Uh, you and I have, have this joy, this gladness, this delight essence flowing through it. Why do you think it feels so good to be happy? Why do you think it feels so good to have joy in your heart? Circumstances have a tendency of stealing those things because circumstances in this world are not necessarily the product of the essence and the nature of God. We've been trying to establish that for you. So consequently, many times circumstances bring worry, bring, bring feelings of hurt and depression and anger. All that is contrary to the nature of God. That is not the nature of God. But that also is good news for you and I to realize that God is happy, man. God God's a joyful God, all right? He's a happy God. He's dead. His heart is dancing. His heart is shouting. It's party time for him. He's a loving father and a happy God, a joyful God. And you need to start changing your image, okay? I just got this feeling if, if the fruit of the Spirit is joy, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus was anointed with the oil of joy above all his companions. That tells me that Jesus probably has the biggest belly laugh of anybody you've ever met in your life, isn't that something? He was a joyful person. Why do you think everybody liked being around him? Wasn't just the things he taught, though. They liked that. Wasn't just the miracles. They liked that. They liked him because he was an outward expression of this life essence of God that was in him, that flowed through him, that it was a magnet and attracted everybody to him. You know, when you sit around and look like you've been, you know, eating pickles and washing them down with vinegar, uh, that does not display the essence of God. When preachers, good-hearted but ignorant preachers, get in the pulpit and they're always talking about a mean and an angry God, that is not an expression of the essence of who God is. Go through the Bible. You cannot find, you can find where God is love, God is this, God is that, and you can never find where God is mean, all right? Uh, his essence is not God. God is angry. God's essence is not angry, folks. Has he had some bouts of anger? Well, sure. Did people deserve it? Absolutely. But even in that, he tempered that anger. That's what we're going to see. Listen, if God got angry and just snapped his fingers, all this would be gone, folks. Okay? And so it's still here, which means that he wasn't as angry as all the, the ignorant, but well-meaning, but ignorant preacher said he was. All right? And so God is joy. All right, let's go to the next one. The next word that we're going to look at here is love, joy, peace. Peace, peace. The word peace, erine, is the, uh, the Greek word for peace. It means a state of quietness, of rest, of repose, of harmony, of order, of security in the midst of turmoil, strife, and temptations. And so God is a God of peace. Now this is according to Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. The word erine here, peace, means uh, uh, prosperity, peace, quietness, rest. 
uh, God is a peaceful God. Man, he's, he's not uptight. He's not an uptight God, okay? He's a peaceful God. This word also means a state of freedom from anxiety and inner turmoil. Freedom from worry, peace, all right? So now think about that. God doesn't worry. Well, that's good news. Well, you said, well, if I was God, I wouldn't worry too. Wait a minute, you're a son of God. Uh, all that God is and has is presently available for you. So why are you uptight? Why are you worrying? God doesn't. God's not uptight. God's not worried. You know, you take a lot of people, they treat God, especially even in ministry. I know a lot of ministers, and they treat God as a tyrannical boss. They're almost afraid. Oh, my God, if I don't do this, I can lose my job. Oh, man, if I don't do this, God's going to squash me. No, 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 no. That's not God. God's not like that. That's not the nature of your God, my friends. All right? God is a peace God. He's peaceful. His nature is peace. He doesn't get uptight over things. He's not always in a state of worry and turmoil. Uh, he is free from all that. All right? God is a peace God. God's essence is peace. God's nature is peace peace. All right, let's go on to the next word. So the, 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 the fruit of the Spirit, which is the essence of the nature of God, is love, joy, peace. Now the next one is long-suffering. Now, i got a lot of things to say about this one. This is one of those important ones that most Christians haven't grasped. Most ministers haven't grasped. So I'll tell you, even when I go through the notes again, even though I'm teaching this to you, I realize there's some places in my life I need a little more of understanding in this. And this one is long-suffering, long-suffering, patient endurance, to bear long. Now, what do we mean by long-suffering? A state of emotional calm in the face of provocation, misfortune, and, and it comes or it keeps a person without complaint or irritation. It's a state of emotional calm in the face of provocation or misfortune and is without complaint or irritation. God is long-suffering. That's part of his nature. He is long-suffering. Now, that was, again, from Strong's uh, exhaustive concordance there. So it's a state of emotional calm in the face of provocation or misfortune without complaint or irritation. You know what that means? God don't get irritated. Now, i got to admit, sometimes I get a little irritated. I think I'm long-suffering. I'm raising my kids. I, I tried to be long-suffering, but my long-suffering had limits. It would only long-suffering to a point, and then boom. All right? Uh, but God's not like that. He has no boom. He's just continually long-suffering. He wasn't like me as I was. I think I'm getting better over time. I think I'm becoming more mature in this process. But God is long-suffering, my friend. He is long-suffering. Uh, the mad, majestic God graciously restrains his righteous wrath. He does so in covenant faithfulness, but also out of regard for human frailty. Think about that. God's long-suffering. He, rest, he restrains his wrath, folks. God's not out smiting people. He's not the holy smiter, all right? Yeah, but I deserve to be smitten. Yeah, you probably did, but thank God he is long suffering. He restrains his wrath. It means to be patient, to bear with, to be long tempered, to be long tempered. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Now, this particular verb uh, appears uh, 10 times in the New Testament, as of now 14 times in the New Testament, it means to have patience. Uh, designates the forbearance of God with mankind on whom he does not pour out his wrath, but instead forgives and saves them. Let me say that one again. This designates the forbearance of God with humankind on whom he does not pour out his wrath, but is instead he forgives and saves them. God is long-suffering. You don't have to be afraid of God. Yeah, I know you've heard a lot of preaching on the fear of the Lord. All right, it's amazing how just a handful of verses on the fear of the Lord gets so much press in the mouths of preachers. Listen, God is also long suffering. Yeah, we need to be in awe of Him. He is God, but we don't need to be afraid of Him. We need to be afraid of the devil sometimes, but not afraid of God. God is long-suffering. So he doesn't pour out his wrath on you and I. Instead, he forgives us and he saves us. Um, uh, the good and the wise do not quickly let their wrath come forth. That's another statement about the long-suffering of God. The more good somebody is and the more wise somebody is, the, 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 the more restrained they become with their wrath. 
Now, God is the essence of all goodness, and God is the essence of all wisdom, and so he is the essence of restraining his wrath. I'm going to tell you this. You can't tick God off. I'll say it again. You can't tick God off. Nothing you can do in your life can cause God to be anything other than long-suffering towards you because that's part of his nature. Do people go to hell? Absolutely, they go to hell. Does the curse break out in the lives of people? Absolutely, they do. Well, isn't God doing that? No, God doesn't have to because there's a self-destruct mechanism. If you become if you become overwhelmed with this world and do the things that this world says to do, you open the door, the Bible says, and the curse will get you. The devils will come in and afflict you. God's sitting there waiting for you to repent so he can bless you, so he can love you, so he can deliver you, okay? And so we need to recognize these things. I'm not saying that, you know, in the Old Testament, there are places God killed people. I'm not going to go, okay? But on the other hand, it wasn't the, that wasn't wrath. That wasn't because he ran out of long-suffering. Um, they, had, they made choices, and that was the judgment that came upon him. And I'm sure it grieved his heart. Can you imagine having to bring come some kind of uh, judgment upon your own children? It grieves your heart to do that. It's contrary to what is necessary, but sometimes love must bring proper correction. All right. All right. Let's go on to the next one. Now we could just spend all day on every one of these, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering. Now the next one is gentleness. Now gentleness and the one after that goodness are kind of tied together. And we're going to see two different sides of the same coin. Gentleness. Gentleness is a disposition to be gentle, soft spoken, kind, even tempered, cultured, refined in character and in conduct. Now we're talking about the nature of God. This is the nature of God. This is his essence, all right? We're learning who God is. Uh, it, it also means, let's see here, what, what book is this from? This is from um, uh, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. And it says this, a goodness, uprightness, mildness, kindness. This noun occurs 10 times in the New Testament. In the New Testament, in the ethical sense, it means excellence and honesty, whereby the term managed to combine the idea of moral perfection and sublimity with that of friendliness and loving kindness. <laughs> Where did this come from? <laughs> Wait a minute, gentleness means we're combining moral excellence and honesty with friendliness and kindness, loving kindness, uh, respectability, friendliness, clemency. Clemency means like the, the, the president or the governor that, uh, you know, lets people off of their crimes and so forth and so on. Uh, that's what that's talking about. Clemency. That's what that's talking about. Listen, God is, he's loving, kind. He's friendly. He's respectable. He's, he's genuinely honest toward you and I. All right. He doesn't hide stuff. He's not mean. He's, he's not an ogre. He loves us. He wants to fellowship with us. Just read over about Adam in the garden before the fall. God would come down and walk in the cool of the day and talk with him and fellowship with him. It's the desire of the Father. Nothing has changed. We are now sons of God. That's what he desires to do for us. The word gentleness denotes goodness, the sense of what is upright, of kindness of heart and act. It signifies not merely goodness as a quality, rather it's also goodness as an action, goodness expressing itself in deeds. And so God is gentle, my friends. Thank God our Father is gentle. This isn't just fruit of the Spirit for you and I. This is the stuff that can grow on us now because the stuff that he is now flows through us is called life and this is what it will produce god is all these things god is love joy peace long suffering gentle and the next one goodness now this one is the state of being good kind virtuous benevolent and generous to be generous generosity uprightness of heart and life. This is the quality or moral excellence of the good person. So gentleness talks more about the action where goodness talks more about the heart. It's kind of the same side or two sides of the same coin. Be God is gentle because God is good. It's just that simple. All right. Uh, for the Lord, he is good and his mercy endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Yeah, but what does goodness mean? It's the state of being good 
the state of being kind, the state of being virtuous, the state of being benevolent, the state of being generous. You don't have to earn everything. You don't have to sow a seed for every penny of blessing that comes from the Lord, folks. He's just going to bless you because he loves you and wants to be a blessing. It's his nature to be generous. He's upright. It's his quality of a good person. God is a good person. If God lived on the earth, he'd be the best person you ever saw. He'd be the kindest, he'd be the gentlest, he'd be the most charitable and good, he'd be the happiest, he'd be the most loving. If he lived on earth, he'd be the epitome of what everybody would want in a friend, a spouse, a family member. He'd be the, the ideal. He is. That's his essence. That's his nature. So when we talk about these fruit of the Spirit, we're just not talking about things God wants or exacts upon us and has no intention of being that way himself because that's the way a lot of people have. They, I mean, come on. He, want, he wants me to be generous, but he's not generous. Come on now. God is the... He is. If you look in the dictionary next to generous, you got God's picture there, all right? God is the one. He's, he doesn't set limits. I only be generous if you do this, if you do that, if you do this. No, 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 no. God is just plain generous. And so unless you you're doing things that forces him away because of your actions, because of your words, then God is going to approach you and be generous towards you. All right, now the next one here. Let's keep reading. For the fruit of the Spirit or the nature of God is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, and now faith. All right, faith. Now, wait a minute. Now, God's nature is faith. God is faith. Oh, yeah, God is faith. The word faith uh, is the Greek word pistis. It's the living, divinely implanted, acquired, and created principle of inward and wholehearted confidence, assurance, and trust. Now, that's something, isn't it? Huh? That's God. It's a personality thing. I'll tell you, God doesn't have any insecurity. As basic faith, faith says that. If, you, if you're walking in faith, you have no insecurities whatsoever. Uh, assurance, belief, fidelity. Uh, this means, what does it mean? Depend on someone without qualifications. You don't have to earn uh, the right uh, for you to be able to depend upon him. It's the state of being someone in whom complete confidence can be placed. Trustworthiness, dependability, and faithfulness. Now, that's a picture of God right there. My friends, the state of someone in whom complete confidence can be placed. So God functions from that perspective. Not just that we can be confident in Him, but He has all these other attributes. God's not trying to become God already is, all right? He's already perfection. He's perfected in this. So God is the perfection of, 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 of proper attitude and, and self-esteem. And He has confidence in Himself and thereby exacts nothing upon you trying to build Him himself up. He's trying to elevate you to his level. That's God. God is filled with this kind of stuff. And the Bible calls that faith, an inward trust, an inward confidence. And we're trying to have that just in him, let alone in ourselves. All right. But listen, if you start walking with God, his nature begins to get on you in new dimensions. And so that's what we're talking about. The fruit of the spirit are not just things that God is trying to exact upon us, but these are things that are part of his nature that if we allow his essence to flow, his life to flow through us, his zoe, then this stuff begins to change us and we begin to be just like him because he's our dad, he's our father. And so we're from the same gene pool, if we can say it that way spiritually. All right, the next one after faith is meekness, meekness. Now, it's kind of hard, you know, when you go through, wait a minute, you mean God is meek? Oh, yeah, man, God is the meekest person that you can find, all right? Uh, meekness means mildness, kindness, modesty, gentleness, a gentleness of attitude and behavior in contrast with harshness in dealings with others. So the best thing is take somebody that's harsh and how they deal with people. Now take the complete opposite of that. Now that's God. That's meekness, my friends. It's not Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is a state of being. Uh, it's modesty. It's, it's being balanced in tempers and passions. It's patient in suffering injuries without feeling a spirit of revenge. And so, uh, you know, you, you can say all kinds of nasty things to God and he doesn't get even. All right. Isn't that wonderful? 
<laughs> well, aren't you glad that God ain't like most of the people that you and I know, even like people in church and, and me even as a minister. I'm glad he ain't like some of the preacher friends that I have and so forth. That doesn't mean that preachers aren't trying to do good, but God's way above all of us, my friends. God is so meek. Uh, he has the disposition to be ken- gentle, kind, indulgent, balanced in tempers and passions, patient in suffering injuries without feeling a spirit of revenge. I encourage you to look some of these things up. All right. The next one we have here is temperance, meekness, and then temperance. This is our last one. Temperance is self-control, a moderation in the indulgence of appetites and passions, a moderation in the indulgence of appetites and passions. It denotes power or lordship, which one possesses over oneself. Temperance. God is temperate. He, man, his passions and his appetites don't get out of control. He, he moderates everything. It's a moderation of any indulgences. So guess what? He's not trying to act like God in front of you to show off. There's no showing off with God, folks. He brings all these things under control. Another way to say it, God never loses his temper. He's temperate. <laughs> Hence the word temperance, all right? God never loses his temper. He's temperate, all right? Now think about that. God doesn't lose his temper with you. He does, he's not going to get the board out and spank the dickens out of you because you did something he didn't like and you set him off. But now see, the people that we have around us, our parents perhaps in days gone by or, or other authority figures that we've had in our life, they weren't always temperate. Therefore, when we start looking at God as an authority figure in our life, we begin to have the feeling that God is like them, that this is how authority acts. And that's not how authority acts, man. Authority or is, it should act like God. It should be loving, joyful, peaceful, long-suffering, gentle, good, filled with faith, meek, and temperate. And all those things is what God is. Not what he does, it is his nature. It is the way he is. God is the most loving, most benevolent, most kind, most temperate, most well-controlled, most uh, well-thought-of, the most well-spoken individual in the universe. He's our God, and that's why we can serve him wholeheartedly. All right, I hope you got something out of this lesson. I would encourage you to go through and do your own study of the of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, we just took a verse, uh, basically two verses, 22 and 23, and, and we just went through that. Now, we realize that this is the nature of God, which is, he says, contrary to the nature that's in the world. But he said, if you'll walk, letting the Spirit be the Spirit to you, leading, guiding, and fellowshipping with the Spirit, then you'll begin to grow this fruit instead of living carnally like all the people in the world who are not born again, who do not have the life of God flowing through them. They can't grow this fruit. Okay, uh, they may dialogue about it. They may, uh, you know, uh, study it. They may, but they'll never be able to do it. it the, this, the ability to do it is not on the inside of them, but it's in you because this is part of your nature. Because it's the nature of God, and you're the child of God. You are a son and or a daughter of God. So I bless you today, and I just encourage you keep studying. These are good things that we're learning. Make sure now I want you to finish reading the entire book. Uh, before your final exam, the Most High, Dr. Lester Summerall, Seen the Almighty. I think there's 21 chapters in here. And so we want you to read all of these chapters. God bless you, Tim Mann here, uh, wishing you success in your walk with the Lord.